Ladies and gentlemen, it's March 1954. You're in the Nyeru district of Kenya, a region occupied by the British. You're Molly Weirimu, awakened in the early hours of the morning by the sound of rifle butts breaking open the door. You've been singled out. They tell you they've just killed your husband. And then they start to beat you with their gun butts. One hits you and the blow throws you to the next, who throws you to the next. Nobody cares about where they hit you. You're beaten into confusion, and you don't care if you live or die. The noise awakens your two-year-old son. He screams and runs to you through the legs of the soldiers. As you're being thrown around, your son still searches for protection between your legs. They tell you that they're giving you the independence that your husband wanted you to have. They don't care about your little boy. As you're being thrown around, you watch him be trampled. You're beaten so much that your body is numb and it no longer feels pain. But your mind, it replays the image of your son's body lying dead on the floor of your house. This is a true story and Molly isn't alone. The collective devotion that these troops displayed in terrorizing locals is atrocious. Members of these forces had been officially instructed to hate. Only half a century on, and we've made very little attempt to address the moral balance. Reparations are the way in which to do this. Before I continue, it falls to me to introduce the opposition speakers. First, we have Alpha Lee. He's a member of the Debate Selection Committee and having graduated from Imperial College with a first-class degree in chemistry at the age of 17, I think it's far to say that he's already achieved far more than I ever will. One of his most famous papers is entitled Describing Spin-Selective Reactions of Radi Radical Pairs Using Quantum Jump Approaches. Let's just hope that his argument today is slightly more digestible. <laughs> the Right Honourable Sir Richard Ottaway is a law graduate from Bristol. Bristol and became the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. He's also been the MP for Nottingham North and Croydon South. And living very close to one of these areas, I think actually he may be more empathetic to those living in areas lacking economic prowess or cultural history than we may have imagined. Professor William Roger Louis is a distinguished historian and the editor-in-chief of the Oxford History of the British Empire. The book that is honestly the closest thing that we as undergraduates of modern history have to a textbook. So the fact that we're on opposing sides of the debates probably says more about my performance as a first-year historian than it does as anything else. <laughs> and lastly, Professor John Mackenzie. He's a historian of the British em Empire, and he studied the importance of popular culture and imperialism throughout Britain. Partly because I've run out of jokes, and partly because his research is just that fantastic, I have to say that his re-evaluation of the literature of Orientalism is incredibly insightful and we hope that he may be able to shed light not only on the cultural impact of the, on the colonies, but on Britain itself. These are your oppos opposition speakers, Madam President, and they are most welcome. <laughs> so reparations is a term that's often used to mean a cash payment, but it goes far beyond this. It means any sort of assistance that we can offer to those who have been wronged. So what is it that categorises aid, be it financial or otherwise? What is it that makes reparations distinct from any other form of support? It's our intention. It's the fact that when we provide this help, we are doing it because we recognise our past injustices. It's because we recognise that in some way, even if it's seemingly impossible, we must try and redress the moral imbalance. And that's what we'll be discussing in this debate. The motion calls for a moral debate. It's not about how we could logistically pay reparations, or from whom or to whom. It's about whether Britain should recognise its wrongs, and whether, if and when we help former colonies, it's done with the intention of trying to right past injustice. We're not just interested in putting a price on suffering. Reparations can help to repair the still ongoing damage done to minds, cultures, and economic circumstance. Rather unsurprisingly, my argument falls neatly into three key points. Firstly, from a humane perspective, 
with the number of lives lost and tortured. And this is what I'll be spending most of my time on. I'll also look a little at the economic and cultural impact, though I'm sure the speakers following me will elaborate on this further. But before I launch into this narrative, it's important to take a step back and ask why it is that we're now paying for the crimes of the past. And I would argue that it's because these crimes, to this day, go unrecognised. Half a century on from the end of the empire, and most people in Britain have no idea of the horrific actions of the colonisers. We continue to benefit from their exploitation, with no idea of the price paid. We are not in a position to move on, to just look forward, because we never recognised what fully happened, let alone began to make an adequate apology for it. So what is the current attitude in Britain towards the empire? Well, we can see it in the small things. It's the fact that streets are named after slave owners, and their houses are preserved as English heritage sites. We seem to blindly follow this contemporary idea that the purpose of colonisation was to spread the Western ideals of civilization, commerce and Christianity. And this is at least working off the assumption that British people are aware of the broad events that led to the establishment of the British Empire. There seems to be very little recognition of it, even when we are helping former colonies. It's perhaps ironic that this year Comic Relief focused its efforts on Malawi and Uganda, without any mention of Britain's role as the chief colonial power and in determining the present state of these countries. As Frankie Boyle apparently remarked when watching it, it was as if the British volunteers had travelled there and said, thanks for the gold, lads, thanks for the diamonds, we had a whip round and got you a fishing rod. <laughs> Tony Blair claimed that Britain's empire should be the cause of neither apology nor hand-wringing. In fact, that it should be used to further Britain's global influence. When Britain and France, two old imperial powers that had occupied Libya after 1943, began bombing it, there was much talk in the Middle East of the revival of British imperialism. So it's clear that our modern perception of the empire, where it does exist, is largely false to the extent that former colonies can sometimes fear recolonisation. Reparations are necessary because we have this ambivalent attitude towards the empire and we've therefore never properly tried to make amends for those actions. But what were the actions exactly? Well, firstly, let's look at the lives lost and those that were tortured. Revisionist historians have argued that the colonial experience, for those who actually experienced it, was just as horrific as the opponents of the empire had always maintained that it was, perhaps even more so. New generations have recovered tales of rebellion, repression, and resistance. White settlers in the Americas, in Australia, in New Zealand, in South Africa, in Canada, in Rhodesia, in Kenya, they simply took over land that wasn't theirs, often slaughtering and purposefully exterminating the local indigenous population, as if they were vermin. So when discussing the number of people who died, or were tortured, it can be easy to see them as historical figures, and to miss the full impact. So instead, I'd like to focus on the Kikuyu in Kenya. Elkins, a brilliant Harvard historian, reveals that the British detained not 80,000 Kikuyu, as official histories maintain, but almost the entire population of 1.5 million people. Thousands were beaten to death or died from malnutrition and typhoid, many of whom were children. Inmates were used as slave labour, and those who disobeyed the rules, they were killed in front of the others. Interrogation under torture was widespread, with many men anally raped, using knives, using snakes, and using scorpions. Women were gang-raped by the guards. Men were rolled up in barbed wire, and they were kicked around the compound. The horrors of these camps, however, have only recently been revealed. The colonial secretary repeatedly lied to the House of Commons. We must now see this for what it is, a vast, systematic crime for which there has been no reckoning. As I'm on the Union Committee, and therefore an honorary PPE student, I thought I'd live up to the stereotype and perhaps discuss the economic impact of such political actions, which I hope my fellow speakers will continue with further. Many countries were forcibly integrated into the global economy. 
their markets flung open to the free movement of goods, capital, labour and enterprise. Yet these primary producing economies languished while their exports multiplied. So, after decades, sometimes centuries, of their devotion to free markets, they had little to show for it. However, countries which were free to choose to resist international integration, they could modernise, their enterprises could improve their skills, and so they could industrialise. Foreign capitalists found allies in the indigenous landowning classes, and together they perpetrated a social system based on primary production, inequities and repression. Now, contemporaries may have liked to think that this was because the natives were lazy, they were irrational and unfit for taking advantage of the opportunities made available by market economies. In actual fact, Britain would claim free and exclusive access to the markets and resources of informal colonies. The next step, it was often direct expropriation, to use their superior power to capture the assets, the lands and mineral resources of lagging countries, to draft their labour for use on public works. This monopoly power would result in hyper-integration, integration far beyond what would be possible under free markets. The last point I'd like to briefly mention is something that's usually underestimated, the ex- extermination of local culture. I'm sure Dr. Thurrell will be able to discuss the impact on countries such as India far better than I can, but while you have a good idea of the camps where the Kikuyu were kept, it's worth bearing in mind that while these crimes were ongoing, the ones I just described, Loudspeakers would broadcast the national anthem and patriotic exhortations. How then can it be argued that British culture was not forced upon others? Ladies and gentlemen, Britain's empire was established and maintained for more than two centuries through brutal violence, economic exploitation and at the expense of local culture. Large numbers of its inhabitants were obliged to suffer for their involuntary participation in the colonial experience. These countries did not ask for a British overlord. Most importantly, however, this has gone unacknowledged. We are embarrassingly ignorant of our past. Reparations are needed as an apology, so that when we help former colonies, it's not done from a moral high ground, as a favour, and in order to perpetuate a view that Britain is somehow superior to these other countries. Help should be given as a reparation, with the acknowledgement that we are responsible We have a collective responsibility for our past, and this has undeniably had a profound impact on the present. This is the intention which we should hold. Our charity shouldn't be patronising. And given you all, well, at least Joe, enjoyed the last Frankie Boyle quote the last time, I'll end it on another. Give a man a fish and he can eat for a day, we cry. Give him a fishing rod and he can feed himself, we like to preach. Alternatively, don't poison the fishing waters, abduct his great-grandparents into slavery, and then turn up 50 years later on your gap year spouting a lot of shite about fish. (laughs) 